Silverdale, we're so glad that you're here this morning. Would you go ahead and stand on your feet as we sing together? Church, you all can have a seat for just a couple of minutes. 
It's so good to see all of you here with us this morning. Uh, if this is your first time that you've worshiped here with us at Silverdale, we are so thankful that you have decided to join us. What we'd love to ask you to do is if you would, uh, if you are in the room and you have your worship guide, there's a little tear off portion at the bottom of it. If you could fill that out and you can put it in one of the boxes as you exit the room. Uh, if you'd like a digital copy or if you're worshiping with us online, you can go to silverdalebc.com connect. And there has the same information where you can uh, put in your information. If you would check the box that says, I'm a first time guest, we'd love to send a gift in the mail to you really to just let you know how much we appreciate the fact that you're here with us. You know, our pastor often says that um, something unique happens when we gather together to worship the Lord. Certainly, our worship would extend through our personal lives throughout the week in the way that we live. But the Bible makes it very clear that something unique does happen when the body of Christ gathers together to sing songs and to listen to the word preached. And so this morning, we have an opportunity to continue worshiping in song. And the next song that we're gonna sing is called Faithful Now. And you know, what happens when we sing songs is many times we get to declare the truth of that song. Uh, we get to testify that we have seen God work this way. Jesus is good because he did this. Uh, but sometimes, it can be rather difficult to declare that truth over our life because we can't quite see through the fog. We can't quite figure out how God is gonna work all this for our good. We can't quite figure out how this is God's plan for our life. And in those moments, we have the ability to confess the truth that we're singing. And so when we sing this song, Faithful Now, it's a declaration about God's faithfulness in the past as evidence for his faithfulness in the present. And so we get to say, God, I don't know how it's gonna work out, but we believe, we have faith that you will be faithful to us. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So take this time, wherever you may be in your life, when we sing this song, you can say that you are faithful now. Theologian Jonathan Edwards says that you preach your heart hot with the truth of the gospel. Well, here we have an opportunity this morning to preach our heart hot with the truth that God is, is, has been, is, and will be faithful to us. Would you stand with us this morning as we continue to worship through song?
together Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
our lives on you, the only firm foundation, a strong, secure, assured, confident foundation. We will not build our lives on sand, but we will build our lives on your truth. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to Silverdale Baptist Church. If I've not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Maddie, and I get to serve here on our Bonnie Oaks campus as a part of an incredible team. And I'm excited this morning to get to open God's Word with you. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and pull it out. You'll need them here in just a minute. Uh, this morning, we're in week six of our series, Wartime Letters. And hopefully, uh, you've picked up one of these through the atriums, or if you're online, you can grab that on our website or on our app. And it's just a reading guide that will help you follow along with where we're gonna be each week. Uh, and we've been working through the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. Over the last four weeks specifically, and a couple more to come, we've been looking at what Jesus had to say to the church and to these seven different churches. See, in Revelation, the apostle John, he's exiled in Patmos, and he has a revelation, hence the name of the book, from Jesus, where Jesus shows him some things and speaks some things to him, and John goes ahead and he writes it all down for us. And in the midst of this revelation, Jesus speaks this, this word to seven churches, seven different messages that speak to the condition of those churches, but also serve as a message to us. See, while these messages were specifically directed to these seven churches, they apply to us as the church, the universal church. So while Jesus would say to the church in Ephesus that you've, you've walked away from your first love, right? Essentially that you've walked away from me, you've turned your back on me, that message applies to some of us this morning. Some of you in the room, some of you watching online are walking away from Jesus, You've turned your back on your first love. And what Jesus would say to the church at Ephesus is the same message he'd speak to you today. Some of you, like the church in Smyrna, are hurting and suffering. And the hope and the encouragement that Jesus would speak to that church is the same word that he'd speak to you today. These messages, they apply to us, they're relevant to us right now. And today's no different. While this message that we're about to read and hear was directed to the church in the city of Sardis, it's relevant to us. It's relevant for you and I. Recently, I found that whether it be on social media or here at church, that there are well-meaning Christians who wanna paint this picture that shows that, that the church is falling apart, that the 21st century church isn't holding true or fast to the word of God and, and we're compromising to this woke culture or progressive Christianity and that we need to get back to the good old days. But hopefully, one of the things that the, the book of Revelation is teaching, one of the things that this series is teaching you is that the problems that the church is facing today, our issues today are no different than the problems the church faced 2,000 years ago. There's always been a temptation within the church to compromise the truth of God's word. There have always been people who have said that the gospel itself isn't enough to save you, that you've got to have the gospel and this and this and this thing. There have always been people within the church who would twist and distort and manipulate the truth of who Jesus was and what he taught to meet their own agenda. It's nothing new to the church. What we are experiencing today is nothing new to us or God's church. And the church which stood the barrage of attacks then, she'll withstand it today and she'll be strong tomorrow. And it's not because of you or I, it's because of who God is. And because God's plan A to reach the world is the church. And He's gonna use the church and the church will remain strong. But we, as the church, we as Christ followers, 
We've got to figure out how do we respond? How do we engage in these moments? What should we be doing? And these seven letters to these churches are relevant to us now because they teach us how to respond. So today we're going to look at the letter to the church in Sardis. So it's Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's read it together. It says this. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard and keep it and repent. If you'll not wake up, I'll come like a thief. And you'll not know what hour I will come against you, yet you still have a few names inside this, people who've not soiled their gardens. And they'll walk with me in white, for they're worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I'll never blot his name out of the book of life. I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So across the world, or at the very least, across the Christian community, the church in Sardis had a great reputation. It was an active church. It was a busy church. It was likely a church with great leadership, with great structure underneath that leadership, and things were happening. It was the largest of the seven churches that Jesus would write a letter to. It was the most wealthy. People were giving, and those financial gifts were being used to help others. It was a church that had great influence. If it was here today... There would have been Bible studies happening all the time and small groups would have been taking place. Worship services would have been full. The music would have been loud. Kids ministries, student ministries, they would have been awesome. Camps would have been jam-packed. Men's ministry would have been hosting retreats. Women's ministry would have been hosting a tea. They've had a marriage ministry that would have had influence with families and would be making marriages stronger. They've had a senior adult ministry that would continue to pave the way for the church and, and sacrificing preference to reach people with the gospel. They'd have had a counselor ministry that would have come alongside people in the midst of their brokenness to help them navigate that. The church would have continually been trying to figure out how do we reach more people with the gospel? How do we disciple them? And maybe that church would have started a micro church movement to do that. And they would have been going on missions and giving to missions and sending people on mission and supporting those people on mission. And maybe you've come to realize that this church may have looked a whole lot like our church. There's always something going on. There's always something happening. But that's not something to pat ourselves on the back about. See, because Jesus doesn't commend them for it. He actually has a really sharp warning for them. Look what he says. He says, I know your works. I know what you're doing and you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. He says, I know what people say about you. I know what people say when they talk about you. I know what you think about yourself. I know what you're doing. I know how you may have everybody else fooled, but I need you to know, I know, I see, and I'm not fooled. While they think you're alive, I know that you're dead. I know that spiritually, you are a dead church. So if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. This is the first thing you can write. Don't confuse busyness with godliness. Don't confuse busyness with godliness. He says that just doing a lot of stuff Doing a lot of things doesn't mean that you're alive. It doesn't mean that Jesus is in it. Our works and our deeds, what we do, reveals the true nature of our hearts. It reveals who we are. Paul would say to the Galatian church that you can identify a Christ follower by their fruit. So what does the fruit of this church say about them? Well, it tells us that as a people, as a church, maybe they didn't slow down long enough to figure out what God actually wanted from them and for them. Maybe they didn't slow down long enough to discern the will of God, to actually go before God and say, God, what do you want us to do? What do you desire from us? Listen to me. Sin isn't just sin because it has bad consequences, right? Sex outside of marriage isn't just sin because it's hurtful to us and it's hurtful to other people. Adultery, gossip, cheating, you fill in the blank. Those things aren't sinful because they're bad or hurtful. Those things are sinful because they fall outside of God's design for us. For the believer, we find it easy to point out some of the bad things that fall outside of God's design, right? And we get all bent out of shape about them, as we should. 
But one of the most dangerous things for the church, the danger that the church inside us had fallen victim to is that we can get so caught up in doing good that we miss God. We can get so caught up in doing good things, doing good stuff that we miss God. And in our zeal to do things for God, we miss doing things with God and allowing God to do things through us. And when we operate in that manner, we find ourselves operating outside of the design of God and we fall victim to sin. But the dangerous place for the church is that we'll often celebrate that. We'll celebrate the person who's doing all of the things because how awesome is that? And we'll celebrate the person that always says yes to anything we ask them to do. And I'm the chief of sinners in this. But anytime we're outside of the design of God, anytime we find ourselves outside of what God has designed for us or for our church, we fall victim to sin. And for all of our works, for all of the stuff we're doing, for all of the busyness, so often none of it is oriented toward God. In all of our busyness, we lose sight of why we're doing something, why we said yes in the first place. We've lost sight of God and it just becomes another thing to check off the list. It may look alive, but it totally misses the point. I mean, take this worship service. We could have the best musicians. We could have all the bells and whistles. We could practice early and often and stay late and we could do all of the things, right? I could be the, the greatest communicator with the, with the most creative of illustrations. You could sing loud. You could raise your hands. Some of you could take a lap for all we care in this building. Right? And we could do all of the things, but never fix our hearts and eyes on Jesus. Never ask God through the truth of his word to change our lives. I could never point you to a risen king who binds the broken, heals the hurt, and who's taken away the sin of the world by his death on the cross. And if we don't do that, we've missed the point. It's all in vain. There's no reason to be here without the power and presence of God in this place. It's all in vain. And we live in a place where we are in constant danger of doing just that because we have the reputation of being alive. But look what Jesus told the disciples in John 15, five. He says this, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Not some things, not a few things, not things here and there, you can do nothing apart from him. We can be busy and active. We can work ourselves to death and go through all emotions, do all the right things, check off all the boxes, give off the perception and gain the reputation of being alive. But if we're doing them apart from Jesus, if we're doing those things apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, they'll never have life. We won't have life. Apart from him, we die. Many of you know this, my family and I, we live out in Harrison and one of my favorite things to do every day is to drive past the lake coming to and from work. It's like this peaceful kind of reset for me. It's like when I'm on my way to work, it's, uh, I kind of leave all the things at home kind of at home and when I'm coming back home from work, it's kind of my reset to kind of plug right back in again. But one of the things I love over the summer is as we go this afternoon, it's gonna be 81 degrees, probably no different. The lake's gonna be packed, right? Boats everywhere, people tubing, skiing, doing all the things. As I was thinking about this the other day, I was thinking about how much water sports can be like the Christian life. Does anyone wakeboard, water ski, anything like that? Awesome, nobody, just like the last service. So <laughs> it's the most perfect of illustrations for the most perfect of days, right? But I was, so I was looking at, I'm looking at the lake and I was watching people, they're water skiing and, and I'm watching them, you know, they're, they're sitting behind the boat and I'm doing all this just, you know, as we drive by real quick. I'm paying attention to the road, I promise. And I'm watching them hold on to this thing, right? And then the boat slowly begins to pull them and they come up out of the water and, and then by the power of the boat, the boat pulls them across the lake and they're jumping and doing all the things and, and they're hanging on to this rope, right? And they're doing their thing. But at some point, most people, for one reason or another, they let go of the rope. And when they let go of the rope, if the, ro if the boat was going as fast as it can, maybe they keep skiing or whatever for another 10, 15, 20 feet. Or maybe it's two feet, or maybe they go face first and plant it in the ground, right? Instead of water, whatever it may be. But as I was thinking about the Christian life, I was like, man, how much of a picture is that 
of our Christian life. We don't need a whole lot to live out the Christian life. Really, we just need Jesus. We just need the power of Jesus in our lives. Just like a, a, a skier really just needs the power of the boat. Right, we just need the power of Jesus. We hold on to Jesus. We need the power of Jesus to take us through our Christian life, through our Christian walk. But then I began to think about this. That the way we live our lives so often is like trying to wakeboard without a boat. We're holding on and we're trying to do things in our own strength and they have absolutely no power whatsoever because we're disconnected from Jesus. We're trying to wakeboard or jet ski, or water ski, whatever it is that you wanna do, by the power of our, by our own power, by our own strength. And listen, church, if we confuse busyness with godliness, we're in danger of missing God. We're in danger of becoming a dead church. If we try to live our lives by our own strength and our own power, we're in danger of becoming a dead church. You are in danger of becoming a dead Christian if there ever was such a thing. But the God we serve is a gracious God and we're gonna see that in how he deals with his church. So here's the next thing I want you to write down. It's Jesus' five commands. Jesus is gonna give the church five commands, right? And in giving them these five commands, he's essentially saying that while you may be dead, all is not lost. There's hope. There's hope. If death was final, Jesus wouldn't be commanding them anything. But we know because we've read the story that Jesus himself overcomes death. And if death was final, he wouldn't be commanding them anything. But because of grace, Jesus gives us an opportunity to evaluate our lives, to make some decisions, to align ourselves with him and be made right with God. So look at this in verse two and verse three. He says this, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. So here's the first command, and it's this. Wake up. Wake up. And that would have hit the church in Sardis right between the eyes, both historically and spiritually. You see, twice across the course of history, the city of Sardis had been conquered because of an overconfidence and a lack of vigilance within their military. See, Sardis was built on top of these mountains, right? So they thought and they considered themselves to be impenetrable. And that, that feeling, that overconfidence caused them to, to, to sleep a little caused the military to be less vigilant. And then in 549 BC, and again in 218 BC, first by Cyrus and then by Antiochus, the city of Sardis was conquered. And it wasn't conquered by this massive military. It was conquered by a group of small guys who snuck up the mountain, climbed over the walls and opened the gates from the inside. And Sardis was sacked twice. The history would have told them and it should teach us that we're never more in danger than when we're comfortable and at ease. And Jesus is calling that back to remembrance of the church and he's urging them not to suffer the same fate. He's saying, wake up, stay alert. When we grow apathetic toward our faith, when we grow comfortable with who we are and where we are spiritually, we are in a really dangerous place. Here's the second command, he says, so strengthen what remains. Strengthen what remains. Jesus doesn't say, hey, when you wake up, throw out everything and start over. He's saying that when we wake up, we need to take an evaluation of the things that are going on in our lives. We need to take, figure out what's dead in our lives, what's dead in our church, and those things that are dead and don't push us closer to Jesus, we gotta get rid of them. They've got to go, but there'll be some things that are left, some things that have life some things that are beneficial, that are leading us and pointing others to Jesus. And we've got to strengthen those things. Listen, I'm not, I'm not much of a gardener at all. And quite like, that would even be an overstatement if I'm really honest with you. But a couple weeks ago, maybe months ago, my wife came home with some ferns. I'm like, ferns, cool, I can do ferns, right? Hang them up on the porch, put some water in them, great job. Then she gets out these white plants. I'm like, uh, what are those? And they're hydrangeas. And I'm like, hey, well, what do I do with hydrangeas? And some of you are looking at me like, dude, the same thing you do with ferns, right? Just put water in there, you're good to go. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know what to do with, with hydrangeas. I didn't know how to keep up with hydrangeas. I told you, like I am, I am not any green thumbs, any of you green thumbs? Less that water ski, awesome, great, good. 
So we get them out and, and, and we, we put them in these pots by our front porch and like they look cute for about four days. And then they start to go brown. Like all of them start to go brown and die. And I'm like, I'm in a little bit of a panic now because these things weren't quite cheap. My wife liked them. They looked cute. They looked good. Like, so I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm, I'm not a green thumb. What do I do? So I'm Googling what to do. And one website says there's this. One website says there's the other. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to call Daniel. Daniel, our worship leader, he's a gardener. He'll know what to do. So I call him like, Daniel. I don't tell him I've only had these things a week, by the way, because I'm afraid of what he'll think of me if I tell him I've only had them a week. I said, I've got these hydrangeas and they're in, my, they're in these pots on my front porch, uh, but they're dying. I send him a picture. I was like, can they be saved? He's like, yeah, they can be saved, but here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to cut off the heads, the flowers that are dead. I said, say, say what? He says, you're gonna, the ones that are brown, the ones that are dead, you're going to have to cut them off. So just get, just get the stem, just go ahead and, and just snip it right off the ones that are dead, the ones that have some brown on them. And then what that will do is it'll help the others grow, it'll strengthen the others. And the ones that are alive will continue to grow because you'll cut out the ones that are dead. It's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But herein lies the, the real illustration. You know what I didn't do? I didn't cut off the dead flowers. And you know why I didn't cut them off? Because I was afraid of what it would look like I was afraid of what my wife might say. See, she brought these flowers home that were beautiful, that were white, and they, it all looked lush and green, and all of a sudden they started to go, go brown, and I'm thinking to myself, if I just cut them off, it's just a bush. Like, it's just a green bush at that point. And what's my wife gonna say when she gets home, when she sees that there's no flowers on it? I was afraid of what it was gonna look like, and I was afraid of what my wife may say. And while that's a little bit funny when it comes to gardening, some of us in the room this morning, some of us watching online, we've got dead things in our lives spiritually that we're afraid to cut out because of what people may say or the way it may look. Some of us, have, uh, uh, parts of our lives are dying. Parts of our faith are dying and we will not cut them out because of what someone may say or the way it may look. Some of us have got friendships in our lives that are dead, that are literally sucking the life out of us. And we refuse to cut him out. Because what's he gonna say or what's she gonna say? What will my parents think? Some of us have got habits that are destroying us that we refuse to cut out of our life because of what somebody may say or the way it may look. We're more concerned with outward appearances than the way, and the way things look than, than our spiritual lives having life. Here's the next command he gives. He says, remember what you received. Remember what you received. He tells the church that you've received and you've heard something and I need you to remember it. So what had they heard? What they'd heard was the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners from their sin, that he lived the life that they should have lived. He died the death that they should have died, that Jesus himself experienced the full wrath of God that should have been ours. But on the cross, during a brutal and bloody execution, he paid the penalty for our sins so that we can be made right with God. And Jesus is saying, don't forget it. Don't forget what I did on the cross for you. And then remember what I gave you. Remember what you received. When a person hears the gospel and responds in obedience, they, they receive the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That God the Spirit comes to live inside of us. That if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, the same power that rose him from the dead now lives inside of you and me. We've got to remember that God has given us his spirit. He's working in us to do things through us. And that's the reality of the Christian life, that God now lives in us to empower us so he can work through us. Here's the fourth command. He says to keep it to keep it, to hold on, not let go of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, I know if for some of you that are theologians, you look at me like, well, I'm a Christian. I can't lose the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I get that. But what God's word teaches us is that we can grieve the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit that we, by the way we live our lives, can limit the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he's saying, you gotta hold on to it. You gotta live your life in such a way that you don't lose the Holy Spirit, that you don't lose, you, you don't, Forget to understand what he sounds like. You gotta keep it. And then his fifth and final command is this, to repent, to turn away from sin, have a change in attitude, a change in action concerning our sin. And that's a lifelong process. Listen, what I've learned is that the closer that I grow to Jesus, the more aware of my sin I become. 
It's this beautiful dichotomy, right? That the closer I get to Jesus, the further I realize I actually am from him. The more clear my picture becomes of who Jesus is, the more sinful I realize I am. And the more sinful I realize I am, the more appreciative and grateful I become for his grace. You see, when I see myself in light of who Jesus is, when I see my sin in light of who Jesus is, it doesn't make me run away from him, it makes me run to him. When I understand who he is and who I am and the grace that has been given me, it makes me wanna run closer to Jesus. And that's the grace that he's extending to the church at Sardis. It's the grace that he's extending to us today. Now listen, this morning, I don't want you to leave here with questions like, how, how do I know if I'm busy? How do I know if, if, if Jesus is in this thing? And I want you just to be trying to rack your brains this week. So I want to give you three real simple, practical questions that you can ask yourself to figure out, are you busy or are you godly? Is the life in what you're doing? Here's the first one. They're on the bottom of your outline. What place does Jesus occupy in my life? That's the first one. What place does Jesus occupy in my life? And only you can answer that question, right? Because you could ask me, you could say, hey, Manny, what place do you think Jesus occupies in my life? And I could look at you and say, well, you lead a small group, you're at church every week, you're singing a choir and you're doing kids ministry. Yeah, you, Jesus is number one in your life. That's the whole point of this letter, that you can appear to have life, but be dead on the inside. Only you can answer that question for yourself. But I wanna give you three other questions that you can ask. Because it's real easy for us to say, well, yeah, Jesus is my savior. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, is Jesus your Lord? Do you do what he says? Do you respond in obedience when he asks you to do something? Here's three things that will tell you whether that is true or not. How do you spend your time? When you have extra time, when you have time, how do you spend that time? How and where do you spend your money? What are you spending your money on and how do you use your talents? The gifts that God has given you, how and what are you using those things for? Here's the second question. What difference does the Holy Spirit make in my life? Are you living your life responding to the power of the Holy Spirit in you? When the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something or say something or give something, even if it's uncomfortable, are you saying yes? Are you willing to go where he tells you to go? When the Holy Spirit corrects you or convicts you, do you take note and listen or do you blame it on the bad burrito you ate yesterday? Are you responding obediently to the Holy Spirit when he's working in your life? And here's the third and final question. It's this, who is your faith connected to? Who is your faith connected to? See, when our faith is dead, when our actions are lifeless, they often revolve around us, right? Like, I'm coming to church so I can check it off my list. I'm doing, I'm going to a small group, and I'm going to this small group because they do this thing for me, and I want to be a part of that, and I check that off my list. Or I'm going to this church service specifically because I like the music, and I like what I get from this. Or I'm going to hear, hear this pastor because I need a word from this pastor. I need, I need to hear something. Or I'm not gonna do this, or I'm not gonna go there because of what I want or what I do. And and our actions revolve around us when they're lifeless. We're at the center of those things. And I know some of you have legitimate reasons for watching online, but to those of you who are sitting at home because it's convenient, it's lifeless. Our actions have life when they're revolved around others. So who is your faith connected to? The gospel has come to us because it's going to somebody else. There's this cute little meme that floats around on Facebook and Instagram. And listen, I get behind it because it's true in my family in many ways. It says this, that it used to run in my family until it ran into me. Here's the problem. A vibrant spiritual life used to run in some of your families and then it ran into you. And it's not going any further because your faith isn't connected to anybody else. Who is growing closer to Jesus because of the way you live your life? Who's closer to Jesus today because you were a part of their life yesterday? Who's your faith connected to? Look at the way Jesus ends this letter. He says this, you still have a few names inside these people who've not soiled their garments and they'll walk with me in white for they're worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I'll never blot his name out of the book of life and I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. 
Some of us, we read that. I read that for the first time just a couple of weeks ago and I was like, praise the Lord, that's me. And then it was like, God punched me in the stomach. He said, man, if it was just about you, if it was about your life at the moment of salvation, I would have taken you right off the earth. But it's not about you. It's not about you being clothed in white. It's about who are you leading to me? Who are you leading to me so that this is their story too? Our lives have been gifted to us so we can spend them for the sake of somebody else. Our lives are not about us, church. Our lives are about other people. And other people come in a faith and hope and trust in Jesus. Who is your life connected to? Every year I get to lead students and, and people on a mission trip. And undoubtedly, every year at some point on that trip, someone will say, Maddie, I feel like this is what I was made for. I love it. And I look back at them and I say, that's because you were. You were made to spend your life serving other people and telling them about the glory that is found in Jesus. So this is exactly what you were made for. Church, it's what you were made for. Who's your faith connected to? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. God, we're grateful for the truth of your word. God, as I was convicted reading this, about the way I live my life. That so often the things that I can do, the things that I, that I choose to do are about me. They're about my preferences, about m- me being comfortable, about what I want. Because your word reminds us that it's not about us. That our lives are to be spent for other people. So God, this morning, would you move our hearts in that direction? Would you remind us of the truth that my life, our lives have been changed so that you can work in us and through us for the sake of somebody else. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So church, here's what we're gonna do together this morning. In just a moment, we're gonna sing another couple songs of worship. And the question I I want you to ponder this morning, the thing I want you to, to ask yourself honestly is who is your faith connected to? You see, for some of us in the room, You're gonna ask that question and the answer's gonna be nobody. You're gonna ask yourself, who is closer to Jesus because of the way I live my life? And the answer is nobody. But I need you to hear my heart this morning. I don't want you to feel defeated or beaten up or like you're not good enough. I need you to understand that there's grace and hope. And Jesus is saying right now this morning, I want to use you. Will you let me use you to lead other people to myself? All he needs from you is a yes. So would you go ahead and would you stand with me? I wanna pray for us just one more time and then we're gonna respond in worship. Let's pray. Father, as we ask you that question, as we say, who is my faith connected to? Who's closer to you because of me? God, would you speak to our hearts? For the person that could list people after people, God, would you just encourage them? God, for the man or woman in the room that would say, there's nobody, God, would you even now begin to speak encouragement to them? Or would you begin to show them where and how you wanna use them for the advancement of your kingdom? We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Silverdale Online, it has been great to worship with you today. And you know, one of the fun things I love about our chat is seeing all the different places you're joining us from. I mean, today we've had people from Pennsylvania and Union City, Tennessee, uh, family on vacation in Florida at Treasure Island. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, Mont Eagle, Etowah, Cleveland, all around the Chattanooga area, and even as far away as Mexico and Peru. So glad to have been worshiping with each of you today. And I trust that God has used today's service to speak to you. You know, one of the things that that, that I think God just really spoke to me today is, is that each of these letters, as we've been reading them, it says in the letter, Jesus says, I know your works. And what he's saying to us is, I know you. I know everything about you. I know the things you've done. I know the things that are in your heart. I know you. And he knows you and he knows me. And wow, what a great message from Pat, uh, from, from Maddie and from uh, the worship today. It was just fantastic. And know that God does know you. And if there's anything that I can do for you as you're considering what God said today, as you're processing all of this, let me know. You can contact me at Silverdale bc.com slash connect. I'd be happy to have a conversation about whatever God is speaking to you today. Now, I have a couple things I want to share with you, several things going on in the life of our church. I love Silverdale. I love what God's doing here and really want you to be involved. This coming Friday is our movie night. We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. We're going to have a movie and activity night at each of our campuses. I think I'm going to be here at the Bonnie Oaks campus, but whether you come here or you go to St. Elmo or you go to the North Ottawa campus, just go. It's going to be a lot of fun to just be together as a church family and community. And to find out details about these, you go to silverdalebc.com slash summer. Check out all the details. They're a little different at each campus. So check that out before you go. And also, uh, for those of you that have teenagers, maybe grandkids, nieces, nephews, kids of your own, or maybe you're a teen at home watching this. I've got teens. Vive Camp is coming up just a few weeks away. Be great for your kids to be here. My kids are excited about it. We want yours to be as well. And so go to the website, silverdalebc.com. Check out our student page and find out how you can get your kids involved in Vive Camp. Well, again, it's been a great service. Hope God has blessed you today through this. And as we say every week, though the service is over, your walk of faith isn't. So keep walking with Christ.